I'm honored to introduce the special guest we've all been waiting for, Professor Jeffrey Oldman, who will be discussing locality-sensitive hashing with us today. Jeff is a professor of engineering in the Department of Computer Science at Stanford and CEO of Gradients Corporation. Prior to his appointment at Stanford in 1979, he was on the faculty of Princeton University between 1969 and 1979. From 1990 to 1994, he was chair of the Stanford Computer Science Department. He has held Guggenheim and Einstein Fellowships and has received the Sigmod Contributions Award, the ACM Carl V. Carl Storm Outstanding Educator Award, the Newt Prize, the Sigmod E.F. Card Innovations Award, the IEEE Von Neumann Medal, and the NEC CNC Foundation Prize. He is the author of 16 books, including books on database sim- systems, data mining, compilers, automata theory, and algorithms, all of which are recognized as standards in computer science. With that, please welcome Professor Jeffrey Ullman to present his session. Okay. Uh, hello. Um, I guess I can't see you, but uh, I hope there are people out there and um, uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to, to give a little talk. Uh, I'd like to talk about what is one of my favorite topics. Uh, it's it's called locality sensitive hashing. It's it's a a modern uh, example of a of an important uh, computer algorithm, uh, and its purpose is to enable you to find similar pairs of items of some sort uh, efficiently. That is, without actually having to compare every. A uh, single pair of, of items in what could be a, a large set. Uh, so I'm going to explain. Um, well, first, just uh, basic the basic hashing uh, idea, which I assume that, that most of, of you out there uh, uh, are familiar with, uh, and then talk about locality sensitive hashing uh, in general, and uh, finally talk about an application. To something called entity resolution, and we'll, we'll talk about entity resolution. It's uh, basically finding records that probably rent, represent the same entity. Uh, for our purposes, an entity will be a person. Uh, and uh, again, I'll, I'll finish up by by showing you a, a locality sensitive hashing or LSH based solution uh, for this problem uh, of the problem of of entity resolution, which in principle could involve looking at all pairs of records uh, from some large set that's uh, typically prohibitive, uh, but LSH solves it. Okay, before I proceed any further, uh, you can find out about uh, LSH from a free book that I wrote with uh, Yuri Leskovich and Anand Rajaraman. Uh, there's the, the link is showing up there. It's called Mining of Massive Datasets. I should comment, it's published by Cambridge Press, uh, but they are uh, allowing us to offer free downloads from that, uh, from that website. Uh, and while we're at it, here's another free book, which some of you might be interested in. It's a more basic book. Um, it was written with, by uh, Al Ajo and, and, and myself. Uh, uh, yes, I am, but it says, Um, wait, it says my screen sharing is paused. Resume. Oh, oh, okay, sorry. Huh. Okay, can can you see? Wait, let me back space. Can you see this? Are the uh, foundations for computer science? Oh, huh. All right. Um, all right, let me try a new share. Okay, now can you see the, um, okay, can, can you see the, the uh, introductory slide? Okay, now, now can you see free book? Yes, okay, another free book? 
Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm sorry. So let's, uh, if anybody wants to take this down, um, I shared um, the, the, uh, the the slide set itself. So I, I assume that uh, people attending the open hacks can, uh, can get the slide set, get the links. Um, at any rate, okay. So here's free books. Um, okay, so let, let's talk about hashing, first of all. Uh, M Marvin Minsky is one of the, the grand old uh, computer sci original computer scientist. Uh, once defined a computer scientist as somebody who believes that hashing is real. Uh, that is, uh, that is, it's possible uh, to maintain an arbitrarily large set of items uh, in, for which you can insert new items whenever you want, you can delete items whenever you want, and you can look up items, that is, uh, find, find them if they are in the set. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that you can do this all in uh, a constant time per operation. That is, it doesn't depend upon how big the set is. No matter how big the set is, just some small uh, constant amount of time uh, lets you do each of these operations as, as many times as you like. Uh, now, if you know about hash tables, you see that that is really possible. It's, it's really, technically it's on the average, uh, average constant time per, per, uh, per operation, uh, whereas some operations could, could take more than, than others. Uh, uh, but the, okay, if, if, I hope, again, I hope people have seen this, but if, if not, the idea behind a hash table is you create some uh, large number of buckets B and you use a hash function H that randomly, well, takes an, an item as an argument and returns a random bucket number. Always, of course, the same number for the same item. Okay. And uh, okay, so if we, if we want to find an item or know which bucket to put an item in, uh, we only have, we can, if, if X is the item, we compute H of X, the hash function, and that gives us a bucket number. And once you have the bucket number, you just look in that bucket. Okay, so if, um, if the hash function really randomizes things, uh, and uh, the number of buckets is something on the order of the, of the number of, of different items, uh, then a typical bucket will only have uh, maybe one or two items. And so it's easy to find those items in the bucket. Um, you might, let's say, use a linked list for each bucket, but the lists are of length one, two, or, or some very small number, easy to, to find things. Uh, so I wanna just give you an example uh, this is a very small hash table. It's got uh, B equals seven buckets. Uh, and the hash function I'm going to use is um, the remain, the, the, the items will be integers. And I'm just going to compute the remainder of uh, X divided by B. Okay, or, or X mod B, if, if, if you're familiar with that. Now, I'm going to throw in um, um, just, be arbitrary, I'm going to throw in the triangular numbers. Uh, the triangular numbers are those uh, numbers of items that can be arranged in a triangle, like the 10 bowling pins are arranged in a triangle. So that's, uh, so 10 is a triangular number. Uh, another way to look at it is a triangular number, the nth triangular number is the sum of the first n integers. So it's 1, 3, 6, uh, 3, 6, 10, uh, 15, 21. Okay, those are the first six triangular numbers. Now, uh, again, I, I threw them each into the bucket, which is the um, remainder when that number is divided by, by uh, seven. Uh, so for example, 10 divided by seven leaves a remainder of three, so it goes into bucket three. Same as, as the number three itself, which is also a triangular number. So you can see there's some flattening. It's not a completely even, you know, you'd like it if, if maybe 15 went there and 10 went there, so that no bucket is bigger than one. Uh, in general, you can't do that, but the more items you throw in, the more, the closer to average each bucket becomes. So for example, I want to look up the number, uh, number 15. Uh, I hash 15, I find that would go in bucket one. And I have maybe this linked list, I look at one, that's not 15, uh, 15, that's it, I got it. 
Okay, so that's that's how um, hashing works. Um, and just to, to give you a quick example of, of, of an application, uh, let's see, Facebook, uh, all, you know, all big websites like to count the number of unique logins uh, that they have each month. Uh, for Facebook, that number would be around 2 billion. Okay, so I could, okay, the, the first thing you might think about is, well, I'll keep a linked list of all of the uh, Facebook uh, I IDs that have logged in this month. And then when a new one comes in, I'll uh, just go down the list, see if it's there. If not, then it's a new one. I'll, I'll add one to the count and so on. But uh, after a while, you're, you're, you're traipsing down a linked list of length of billion. And while um, Facebook has lots of computing power, so I suppose they could do this. Um, it, it just seems like a monumentally dumb way to do it. Okay, uh, so the, the, the hash table, um, you, you, they'll have some number of buckets, like a billion buckets or something like that. Uh, when you log in, they're gonna hash your ID and find out if you're already in the hash table, which means you've already been counted, so we don't wanna do anything. Uh, so if you, uh, you find out what bucket you would go in, you look in the bucket if you're there, and that's a very quick operation. Uh, if you're in the bucket, then we, we just uh, will ignore you. Well, we'll let you on to the Facebook services, but we, don't, we won't add one to the count of unique users because apparently we already counted you uh, previously. If they're not in the bucket, then we have to do two things. Uh, we'll add one to the count because this was a new user this month, and we'll add that ID to the bucket so that we don't count them again. Okay, so that's, that's hashing. Now, locality sensitive hashing uh, is connected to ordinary hashing only tenuously, uh, but uh, it's another kind of magic that uh, you, uh, again, you, you won't believe you can do this until you see how it's done, okay? Uh, what, what it's saying is, okay, we have this you know, large set of items. We want to, to home in on the pairs of similar items and look only at them, and maybe a few others that turn out not to be similar, but certainly not any anything like all of the pairs of items. And, uh, and yet, items that are similar, I'm sorry, uh, if items are similar, then uh, they have a very good chance of uh, that, that we will look at them and uh, identify them as similar. And if the pay items are not similar, then there's a very small chance that we're going to look at them and, and examine their similarity uh, and say, no, they're not similar. Okay, so we can do something that looks like it's inherently quadratic in much less than quadratic time. Okay, well, uh, again, LSH is really, a, it's a body of techniques. It's not a, a single technique, just as, as ordinary hashing really is, is a body of techniques. Uh, um, but the, what all of the uh, examples of uh, locality sensitive hashing have, have, have in common is that uh, you use some number of hash functions, and I put quotes around hash functions because uh, they might not be hash functions and look anything like the example that I just gave, example of a real hash function that I just gave you, a, a remainder uh, of. Uh, uh, remainder of, of a division. Um, but we're going to have, we're going to use several hash functions and each hash function will independently throw items into its own buckets. And uh, then we only want to look at the pairs of items that at least in at least one of these hash functions, they wind up in the same bucket. And we hope the buckets will all be very small so there aren't too many pairs. 
Um, now, you know, it, what's magic is that if you use the right hash functions, and again, there's a very complicated theory, and I, I invite you to look at the um, at this at the mining of massive data sets book if if you're interested. Uh, but for many common classes of items uh, and notions of similarity, uh, you can arrange sort of magically that if pairs are similar, then they will very likely wind up in the same bucket for at least one of the hash functions, maybe more than one. But if the pairs of item, if a pair of items are not similar, then there's a very small chance that they wind up in the same bucket. So we never have to look at most of the pairs, okay? And where most of the things we don't look at are almost certain to be dissimilar. Uh, well, as I said, if, if you, the great thing about this is that if you design the hash functions correctly, uh, you never have to examine more than a small fraction of the pairs. Uh, but there is a downside. You're paying a cost in that there will be false negatives. That is, there will be a hopefully small number of pairs of similar items that you never even look at and therefore don't identify as similar. Okay. Uh, now, uh, again, uh, that may, you know, in some application that may be a real problem. The application I'm going to talk about, um, it was uh, definitely not a problem. Uh, but uh, but I, I should warn you that this is that this is part of an, an unfortunate consequence. You can't avoid altogether false negatives unless you do that quadratic look at every pair kind of problem a uh, process. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit, talk about entity resolution. Um, and um, uh, again, I, I wanna first talk about, uh, as I said, entity resolution is looking for similar records and I wanna talk about what similarity is. And uh, I want to give you a, an LS, a, a very simple LSH uh, system that does bucket the records in such a way that, uh, well, it meets those criteria. If the records are similar, they're very likely to wind up in the same bucket at least once. If they're not similar, um, they will probably not wind up in the same bucket. Um, and, uh, and, and then I'm gonna talk at the end a little bit about how we figured out how well we were doing that is how many false uh, how many false negatives uh were well uh, the, the the problem is um we had to find out how how similar is similar enough and i'll, ex I'll explain that that's that's an interesting story as well okay so um anyway the entity resolution problem okay we're given a collection of records um, and we want to determine uh, which records refer to the same entity. Uh, again, entities could be of any any type, really, but uh, most commonly they're 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 actually they represent uh, people. Okay, and we, we'll, we'll, that's going to be the case in, in this story. Uh, and uh, the typical in a, in a Typical application, which I'll, I'll just talk about a, a, another application quickly. Uh, what you want to do is to merge records if they uh, are believed to represent the same entity and not merge them if they don't. Uh, now, the problem is that um, the, the two records could represent the same person and yet the values for what should logically be the same, like their name, somehow comes out to be different. So it's a, here's, here's an example, okay. Um, well, the name kind of looks the same. Um, uh, in one record, the uh, middle initial is missing. And uh, also there's a, oops, what happened there? Uh, and there's, there's a slight misspelling, okay, the, that extra N, very common. Uh, 
Uh, well, are these the same? Well, Alfred may have moved, right? Uh, so the addresses could be completely different. Okay. Uh, and uh, the phone numbers, oops, I'm sorry. I'm not sure why that's happening. Uh, the phone numbers are the same, except the uh, the area codes have changed. That happens once in a while. Happened to me uh, when I moved to Stanford for 41 years ago. I had a 415 area code, and a couple of years later, I was told that they had run out of uh, numbers in that area code, so I had to change my to 650. But I kept uh, the, the otherwise the same the same number. So, uh, are these the same person? Maybe. Okay. Um, it, it, it can be tricky. Okay. Uh, again, a, a very common application, a company like Experian, which does, does credit ratings, uh, they, they get records of transactions of all sources, credit card transactions, bank transactions, and, and, and many other things. Uh, these records have whatever information the credit card company or the bank um, uh, puts on, on the record. Uh, and then they've got to identify who does, does each record talk about. Uh, this is quite important. They don't want to, um, uh, let's say, if, if uh, the bank says you're a deadbeat, or it says, sorry, it says somebody with a similar name is a deadbeat, they don't want to lower your credit rating or at least you don't want them to, that's definitely the case. Okay, so this, this is a very, very tricky and, and important problem. Uh, well, they, uh, you know, they're gonna try to match what they can find in the name, you know, the names, the addresses, uh, their social security numbers, that's a pretty good identifier. Uh, any uh, any uh, state uh, ID, um, but uh, can be typos and, um, and mistakes of, of, of various sorts. So it's, so it's a very tricky problem. Okay, uh, you know, in the, the example I just gave you, you can see the, the kind of thing that could go wrong. Anyway, um, I wanna finish up by, by talking about a, a, a story. Um, after I retired in 2002, uh, I suddenly, I realized I wasn't uh, getting any money anymore. Uh, and so I took a consulting job, um, and this was, I think, in 2004 or something like that. Uh, the situation is this, there are two companies, I'm not allowed to tell you the names of the companies, it actually doesn't matter because neither company exists anymore, and when I tell you how badly they handled their data, you probably won't, uh, you won't wonder uh, why they, they don't exist, but that's another matter. Uh, anyway, company A agreed to find customers for company B, and company B promised if, if, to pay company A if an annual fee as long as that uh, customer remained a customer of uh, company B. Uh, seems reasonable. Uh, but then they had a, a falling out. They argued over how many customers uh, uh, of B's A had provided. Uh, they hired lawyers, the lawyers hired a consulting company, the consulting company hired me, and that's how I got involved. Uh, the problem was, you see, that neither had recorded uh, which customers were in, the, in, this, in this target category. That is, A could simply put a bit into the record that says, I gave this customer to company B, and B could have put a bit saying, we got this company from company A. Simple solution, they didn't do it, neither. So, so here was the problem we had to face. Each company had about a million records, uh, some of which might have been customers from, uh, sent from A to B. Um, and we had to find which, you know, how many uh, customers really appeared in both the set of from A and the set from B. So a million records is not a whole lot of records these days, but there are a trillion pairs of records. And that was a, uh, 
not doable. Now, today, you get a couple of giant instances from AWS and you print them for a day and, and maybe you could, you could get this done. Uh, in 2004, there was no cloud computing. Uh, we, uh, uh, basically, the whole thing was being done by some kid on a laptop, okay, programming in Visual Basic. So we weren't, we just didn't have a whole lot of cycles to, to get this thing done. Uh, okay, um, you know, so, so it would be great if, uh, okay, as a, both companies had recorded the name, the address, and the phone number for these customers. So it would be great if we could find a record in from A set and a record from B set that had exactly the same name, exactly the same address, and exactly the same phone. Um, but uh, there were lots of examples where something had changed. They weren't exactly uh, the, the, the same. So this became a very tricky problem. So the first thing we had to do was design a score that said how similar are records. Well, we, we, this was kind of arbitrary. We, we said, we're gonna give 100 points to a pair of records that have identical names, 100 for identical addresses, and 100 for identical phones. If there are small discrepancies, like a, a little misspelling of the name or uh, missing the middle initial or a different area code, we're gonna deduct, maybe we'll deduct 10 points, 15 points, something. Uh, but a field, we give no similar, no points for a field where the, the we couldn't identify any similarity at all. So, so that's that's an, an okay. That that was an algorithm. We just had to design it. We we just uh, we just did that. Um, may not have been the best measure, but it turns out it doesn't really matter, and I'll explain to you why. Uh, uh, then we have to do an LSH. And we're going to score all the pairs of records that, that the LSH scheme identifies as candidates. That is, the, they, they fall in the same bucket and therefore might be um, identical. And then we're going to report sufficiently high scores as matches. And I'll tell you uh, how we figured out what the sufficiently high mean. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. But, but all we, you know, the point is we never had to look at all trillion pairs of records. Okay, it was um, only really se several million pairs of, of records had, had to be looked at. Much more doable, especially on a laptop. Okay, so as I said, a million, a million squared, which is a trillion, uh, too hard to score. So we're going to use um, uh, three hash functions. Okay, this is a very simple locality sensitive hash. There were three, three hash functions. One takes a record and returns the exact value of the name field. Uh, another one returns the exact value of the address field, another the exact value of the phone field. And we're gonna compare only pairs of records that are identical in, least, in at least one of these fields. Those are the pairs of records that will fall into the same bucket. Okay, so again, the first hash table in principle has a bucket for each name, the second a bucket for each address, the third a bucket for each phone number. Now, the problem is it's gonna miss uh, records that are similar, but happen to have small differences in all three fields, like the Alfred E. Newman records that I, uh, uh, that I gave you as an example just a, a short time ago. So, um, okay, it's reasonable to ask, how did we do? Well, first of all, we took as a gold standard um, those pairs of records that were identical in all three fields, that is name, address, and phone number. And there were about 7,000 such pairs. Now, we reported back to the lawyer that we could claim in a, re re had a reasonable argument that there were 183,000 pairs that uh, that were correct in the sense that they were customers of B that had been, uh, that also appeared in the uh, records from, uh, from company A. Um, we claim that, that the, the, there were about 2,500 false negatives, things that we probably missed. We have no idea what they were. Um, 
uh, it's, how do we do this? Well, we took a random sample and did a, 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 an exhaustive comparison and tried to eyeball uh, the, the ones that looked similar. Uh, and, but, uh, you know, and, and it, you know, counting those that were, looked like they were the same person, again, just judgment call, uh, but they uh, were not, uh, they had no field identical. And uh, extrapolating that to the whole set, we guessed that there might've been something like 2,500 uh, that we missed. We had no idea whether that's correct or not, uh, or, or of course, which ones they were. Now, I wanna give, actually just end with two quick asides. Uh, the first is um, a hash table has a fixed number of buckets. Okay, what I said is we're gonna we're gonna hash uh, the name say so that there's one bucket per name. Well, the num number of, of different names is is in principle infinite. Uh, so how do I make a how do I make a hash table uh, from that? Uh, same thing for the infinite number of possible addresses. Uh, the phones, well, technically they're only 10 to the 10th power of possible phone numbers. So that's, uh, but that's still too large a number to actually build a hash table with that number of buckets. Um, well, in fact, we didn't really hash. What we did instead was we sorted. Uh, we sorted the records by name. Uh, and then you can just take, peel off the list, uh, all the records at the front of the list that have the same name, we put them in one bucket and compared all those records in, in pairs. Uh, and then we went on to the next name and then the next and the next and so on. Uh, and then we, we, we sorted again now on the address and, and we found all those records with the same address uh, and, and ditto for the, the, the phone. Uh, Okay. So that that had the same the same effect in the sense that it let us find all the buckets that had at least one name or at least one address and, and so on. Now, uh, again, the, the, I think a more interesting story is I said we claimed a hundred and I think it was one hundred and eighty three thousand roughly records were. Um, uh, pairs of records were were in fact similar enough that they represented the same person. Um, so the question is how high a score, remember the scores would range from zero to 300. 100, you get 100 points for having an identical name or an address or, or a phone. Uh, and you can get a few more points if uh, you know, if they're not identical, if, if you have let's say names that aren't identical, but have some similarity, maybe the same last name or or, uh, or last names that are almost the same except for a a letter or two difference. Okay. Well, uh, first rem remember the gold standard. Uh, Pairs. The one the, there were seven thousand pairs that had identical names, addresses, and phone numbers. We said these are obviously the same person. Okay. Now, remember what's going on. A signs up a customer for a service that B will provide. So you bought the you paid your money to A, uh, who would then transfer the money to B. And now you've bought the service. Now you have to go to B and say, give me the service. Okay, so you figure that's gonna happen fairly quickly. And in fact, it did. The average creation date, and the records did have fortunately a creation date, uh, between the time that A uh, entered the record and the time B entered the record was 10 days. Now, we figured that, that everybody's going to uh, go to B to get their service within 90 days. That seemed reasonable. So we never even looked at pairs that uh, had a creation date that weren't, that weren't within 90 days of each other. So, so uh, 
Uh, uh, you know, so we didn't even look at all pairs in a bucket. We rather sorted it by, by creation date and then only looked at, uh, in, you know, for each record, only the records that occurred in the next 90 days. Uh, okay, so if I took two random records and all, all I told you was that they, that they are within 90 days of each other, then the average difference would be about 45 days. So I won't explain how you do this, but uh, suppose uh, I have a pool of matches that have a fixed score like 200. Okay, uh, I can compute the average time distance, uh, or time difference uh, for those the pairs in that pool. Say it's X. Well, um, again, you can you can you can figure out the, the formula. Um, the, the some of those pairs will be good matches. They'll have an average of 10 days difference. Others will be bogus matches. They'll have an average of 45 days difference. So the fraction that are valid matches is going to be four to, well, it's this formula here, 45 minus X divided by 35. So for example, if X is, is 10, that says they're all good matches then it's, it's 45 minus X, 35, 35 over 35, that's one, that's a frat, that is uh, fully, all of them are good matches. If X is 45, then the fraction is zero over 35, which is zero. It says they're all bogus matches. Well, it turned out that when we looked at the pool of matches with scores as low as 115, that is a score that says maybe there was one field that was identical and everything else was pretty much different except there were some, some similarities in the address or the phone or both. Uh, they even, even they had a 50% chance of being valid matches. Anything below that, very a smaller chance of being valid. So we, we reported half of those with, um, Again, we couldn't tell which ones were valid, which ones weren't, but we said 15, 50% of those in the 115 uh, score were going to be valid. Well, when we explained this to the lawyers, they really didn't think a jury could understand that. So I think they, they probably settled for a somewhat lower number than 183,000, but uh, they never told us. Okay, uh, let me just finish one, one more quick remark. Um, it, you might think that uh, this technique of validation was very specialized to this application, but it really isn't. All you need is a field that you haven't used in your hashing uh, that has the property that its value is likely to be closer if the matches are true, that is the records represent the same person. Uh, than if they are random, the two ran two different people. Uh, so ju just a quick example: if uh, suppose records had a height uh, field for people, well, obviously the, it, it wouldn't in this application, but but suppose it did. Well, uh, you would expect the true matches. If, if if I have two records that represent the same person, the height. Well, while it might be measured slightly differently. Um, uh, you expect that the height would be recorded as something pretty close if they were, if the two records really represented the same person. Uh, if they were two random people, then, then the difference in heights would be whatever the average is for, for two random people. And then you could construct a, a sim formula, formula similar to that 45 minus X over 35 that will tell you given any pool of, um, of record of pairs of records with a certain similarity score, uh, you can figure out what the fraction of, of true matches were. Uh, okay. Anyway, that's um, that's the story of locality sensitive hashing. I, I encourage you to um, uh, download the um, uh, the free the free book. Chapter three actually is uh, tells you this full story about locality sensitive hashing. Uh, and uh, you'll find uses for it. Okay. Anyway, thank you for listening. Uh